welcome back to What Even Happens in Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker. We'll pick back up with Dr. Emmerich, aka Huey, after Snake defeats the unmanned weapons platform codenamed Pupa. Ever since the Cuban Missile Crisis, the world order is shifting away from mutually assured destruction and towards the peace of détente. But beneath this illusory peace, nations like France, China, and India have been arming themselves with nuclear weapons. The superpowers, meanwhile, America and the Soviet Union, may have committed to easing tensions, but that's not to say the threat of nuclear weapons has disappeared. It's more that the prospect of mutually assured destruction, or MAD, has lost some of its credibility. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, a Soviet Navy officer, Vasily Arkhipov, refused an order that was likely, if he had carried it out, to have triggered all-out thermonuclear annihilation. This seemed to present MAD with a fatal dilemma. Could human beings really carry out total self-destruction? If not, the stockpiles of nuclear weapons accumulated by East and West were not the perfect deterrents they were meant to be. There was no insurance that once attacked, a retaliatory strike would follow. Left in human hands, there is no guarantee a retaliation will be carried out. And if there is no assurance of mutual destruction, MAD as a doctrine, as well as that of deterrence, both fall apart. And that is part of why the Cold War has entered in the 1970s the phase called détente. But at the same time that this relaxation of tensions between the superpowers has fostered something of a nuclear arms race amid other countries, it's also given rise to proxy warfare, insurgencies versus counterinsurgencies, terrorism and private militias. It is to this illusion of peace that Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker is addressed. Snake's organization, MSF, is symptomatic of just such an age, and how its reliance on nuclear deterrence makes such a group as MSF possible. But the game goes much deeper than this, into the notion of peace from the perspective of the humanities. Why do people kill each other in wars, in any era, and can it be avoided? We see this question posed not only literally in the form of Paz and some of her tapes, but also indirectly through the setting of Central America, and in particular, Costa Rica. Costa Rica is banned from having an army, so war is supposed to be impossible there, but in its wake, the country is badly exploited by outsiders both east and west. The Soviets and Sandinistas, as we saw last time, are using it to fund their proxy war in Nicaragua by cultivating cocaine, while American companies and consumers use the fertile landscape to harvest coffee, bananas, and other raw natural resources. And of course, both the banana and coffee plantations that the KGB and Sandinistas were formerly using for drugs, the CIA have taken over in their stead. Hot Coldman used to be an important member of the CIA. Coldman believes all he needs to regain his stature is to come to Langley with proof of a new nuclear strategy, one that is foolproof. One that will persuade not only the Soviets, but the world, that developing nuclear weapons won't be enough to make anyone safe. That way, America would win the arms race for good, and its own nuclear supremacy would go unchallenged. Key to this plan is the rise of the electronic age. Holdman turns to two former NASA specialists, Huey Emmerich and the mercurial British woman known only as Dr. Strangelove. The details will need to wait, but at this point, all we're really told is that Emmerich and Strangelove have been tasked with building Coldman's perfect deterrent by powering it with bipedal locomotion and at its core, an autonomous AI system. Not unlike the Sandinistas, Coldman has been using Costa Rica as a safe haven. Inside this crater base, Huey's team has built the unmanned weapon platforms that you face so far, as well as several others. Each of them reflects a specific function that once tested, will combine to become the ultimate unmanned weapon with nuclear capabilities, Peace Walker. While Huey has been working on the weapon platform's body and locomotion, in a separate facility to the north, Strangelove has been working on the higher level AI, Peace Walker's artificial cerebrum, its so-called mammal pod. 
Once combined with the lower order behavior and reflexive decision making system of Huey's, the reptile pod, the weapon's system will be capable of full automation without any need for human input whatsoever. And its massive size will allow Peace Walker to launch nukes even heavier than the biggest Soviet bomb at the time, the RDS-220. Meanwhile, its bipedal locomotion will allow Peace Walker to be a mobile weapons platform, which will make it impossible to target with a retaliatory nuclear strike. Once complete, this machine, known as Peace Walker, will be capable of triggering itself automatically once it receives data of a Soviet first nuclear strike. It can operate on any terrain, which is one of the reasons that Costa Rica was chosen as its testing ground. And as we'll find out much later, it also carries a hydrogen bomb that it can use to self-destruct after entering enemy territory. With its mobility and adaptability on any kind of terrain, Peace Walker could function essentially like a land-based nuclear submarine. But the man who gave it this bipedal design, Huey Emmerich, never intended for it to actually be used to fire a nuclear weapon. Emmerich, as I said, was a NASA engineer who Coldman poached for the project. This was after Emmerich had shown promise doing research for NASA on a locomotion method for lunar exploration. Emmerich had always been interested in both bipedal locomotion and nuclear deterrence, tracing back to his belief that his father was to blame for everything wrong in Emmerich's life. Huey's father had worked on the Manhattan Project, which is why Huey would like to think he was born with a birth defect, which explains why he can't walk. Emmerich was also convinced that the status quo of nuclear deterrence, though having prevented another world war, was imperfect, and until it was fixed, that it would keep the world enslaved to the fear of nuclear Armageddon. Coldman gave Emmerich research stolen during Operation Snake Eater from one of Emmerich's old associates, the Soviet scientist Alexander Granin. Borrowing heavily from this material, but also from the Shagahat, the weapons platform created by Granin's rival, Sokolov, together with Strangelove, Huey has overseen the production of several unmanned weapons, as I said. Coming to this lab a year ago, Emmerich's project has generated not only Peace Walker, but the other non-nuclear war machines, Pupa, Chrysalis, and Cocoon. Ironically, Coldman is now blackmailing Huey, telling him that if he tries to leave the project, he'll tell the world, that Huey tried to use stolen research. To prove the saliency of this weapon, Coldman wants to take Peace Walker out of its development phase now and feed it dummy data of a Soviet attack. Peace Walker's been moved along with the warheads to a base on the Nicaraguan border, and Huey says the last field test for it is in five days. But if Snake can stop Strangelove from completing the AI, the Peace Walker project will never get off the ground. So Snake, after convincing Huey to join MSF in order to help stop his own creations, heads now for Strangelove's research lab to the north. It is now November 19th. Following up on Huey's intel, Snake searches for the secret research lab of Dr. Strangelove inside a lush and primeval tropical cloud forest. The air is thick with mist and the trees teem with exotic birds. But though it may look like paradise, Coldman has apparently learned of your plans. The entire region is on high alert. Snake uses a mule to infiltrate and then sends it away as a decoy when the flying platform Chrysalis nearly spots him. Outside the ancient Mayan ruin Strangelove's been using to house her lab, Snake runs into an exhausted, half-naked Parisienne. Cecile Cosima Caminata is a French ornithologist who came to Costa Rica to study the distribution of its many species of birds. In preparation for a regional conference, she set out into the wilderness, armed with a Japanese portable tape recorder, in search of that rarest of local birds, the Quetzal. But instead of capturing its signature bird song on tape, Cecile accidentally recorded the very tape that Galvez gave you at the start of the game. That should make Cecile pause this missing friend, who, after all, she and Galvez first told you was the one who recorded that tape. But she's not. Cecile's at least 10 years too old, and she and Paz have never met. Paz speculates that, grief-stricken by the loss of her friend, Paz somehow convinced herself the tape belonged to that friend. But how did the tape get from Cecile to Galvez to you? Something strange is clearly going on. After all, Cecile was presumably captured by the CIA, and Galvez is KGB. 
Speaking of strange, it was Dr. Strangelove who Cecile recorded talking to the voice of the boss, and who in response, once Cecile was discovered, had the French woman taken captive. Told she'd be permitted to leave in a month's time, Cecile was kept prisoner inside the lab, her eyes almost always obscured by a blindfold. But she did manage to overhear Strangelove and the boss talking frequently. And Cecile was told something cryptic by Strangelove about how people should never be sent into space. It seems that Strangelove and the boss have some kind of history, going all the way back to Joy's time at NASA. But if the boss really lives, what is her role in Strangelove's AI project? All Cecile knows is that one of the few things that she did manage to see in the lab while she was escaping was a large tube-like object that seemed to talk. The name it kept calling was Jack. The very sound of his own name here causes Snake to break out in a sweat. Just at the very idea of hearing it uttered again by the boss, or at least someone or something that sounds like her. All along in Peace Walker, Snake has remained deeply traumatized from the events of Operation Snake Eater. Just look at his reaction back when Galvez brought it up at the very start. If the boss is really involved, it would mean literally reliving Snake's worst memories all over again. Will he really be able to kill her a second time? That is the question going forward. Cecile, desperate to make the Ornithology Conference, decided to attempt an escape. Pretending to need the toilet, she says that she managed to grab a keycard and get out, but never found her confiscated belongings, including that tape. Cecile was nearly recaptured, but she managed to evade the guards and finally get away. However, that was not before they reobtained the card that she stole and used to escape. The place this happened was near a Quetzal's nest, and the guard in question wears an orange jacket. Using this information, you manage to track the ID card down, which you'll need because evidently, Strangelove decided to lock Huey's card out. Huey's had a thing for Strangelove since their days at NASA, but she looks down on his timid and unctuous manner. Huey writes a letter he gives you to deliver to her, but she won't really return his advances until the end of the game. After convincing Cecile to join MSF, she'll help you with tips on the local fauna, as well as how to track and become one with the forest. Meanwhile, Amanda has been providing a wealth of wisdom all along on how to act and think in the field like a true guerrilla fighter. It's only thanks to Amanda's help that you've managed to take on everything from tanks to helicopters. As you've moved throughout Costa Rica, one eye-catching animal in particular has been the Morpho butterfly. It will have major importance for Strangelove's portion of the Peace Walker project, as we'll see. But what is that portion? To find out, Snake finally enters the lab, hidden in the ruined Mayan temple of Xochiquetzal. Xochiquetzal was an Aztec goddess of fertility and beauty who was always surrounded by birds and butterflies. Some believe she was the mother of the Aztec flying snake god Quetzalcoatl, whose name in turn was given to the Quetzal. The relevance of all this to Strangelove's project in Costa Rica is somewhat symbolic. Strangelove has been tasked, as we'll soon find out, with creating the first working facsimile of an artificial human cerebrum which she's likened, apparently, to rebirthing a goddess. This project has developed across stages named after those in the Morpho Butterfly's lifespan. And the culmination of it, Strangelove's so-called mammal pod, uses mimicry almost like the way bird songs are passed from parent to offspring. Let me explain. When Coldman first hired her for the project, at first, Strangelove thought that he should build a coldly logical AI weapon that would simply annihilate an enemy's entire nuclear arsenal without mercy. But instead, he insisted on an AI that would be both rational and thoughtful, calculating, but also empathetic, and extremely, above all else, wise. It was then Strangelove saw an opportunity to theoretically bring back to life the woman that she loved more than anything, the boss. This may have been an unrequited love, putting Strangelove, the boss, and Huey in a kind of bizarre love triangle, but it was a deep and enduring love all the same, and it all went back to the trio's days at NASA. 
Strangelove never knew Joy well in life, but in death, Strangelove, thanks to receiving clearance from Coldman to access virtually all of the CIA's files on the boss, managed to learn everything there possibly was to know. Strangelove studied Joy's life, her every decision, every action, with the rigorous discipline of a world-class scientist. But there's only one decision that Strangelove can't understand, the boss's last one, the decision to defect. And the only person who can explain it, the only person in turn who can help Strangelove finish the Peace Walker AI, is you. Strangelove literally lives to find the truth. As she says, much like Snake, ever since the boss's death, Strangelove is the walking dead. She actually planned to kill herself after completing the mammal pod, though she'll change her mind by the end of the game. She's only been placating Hot Coldman all this time to pursue her true goal of bringing the boss back to life. Strangelove not only worked for NASA, as Hubie told us, but also spent time at ARPA as well. It was back during her NASA days, though, when she first met the boss, that her homophobic colleagues dubbed her Strangelove because Strangelove's bisexual. Strangelove wears this name as a badge of honor because to her, being strange merely means you think differently from everyone else. She's one of the leading AI experts in the world, and the Peace Walker project is meant to be her masterpiece. Strangelove is convinced that women have different brains than men, selected by evolution for different roles. This is part of why she feels so close to the boss, why she chose the boss as the model for Peace Walker, and why all the platforms that she got to name bear the initials of British queens, like Mary Stewart, Alexandrina Victoria, and Elizabeth Windsor. It was just that Coldman preferred more of a Mount Rushmore aspect to each AI, naming them with the initials of various American presidents. Strangelove's obsession has to do with yet another branch of the humanities covered by Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker, this time what's known as the philosophy of mind. Are our minds and bodies distinct? If so, what is the mind, and can it live on independently from its original form? Strangelove has embarked on the Peace Walker project in part to test this idea. By recreating a literal version of the boss's will, Strangelove is set out to test whether her beloved can be reincarnated as a ghost in the proverbial machine. But aside from her personal attachment, Strangelove really believes the boss is the best possible candidate for modeling the Peace Walker AI after. Aside from the fact that Joy was a woman, which for Strangelove means her brain is naturally more inclined towards empathy, Joy already proved that she could do what maybe no one else in modern history can, take sole responsibility for the fate of the world. There are also more practical reasons why Peace Walker was designed as an unmanned platform. Huey tells you the necessity of bipedal locomotion meant that any human pilot wouldn't have survived the violent shaking, while there's also the matter of Peace Walker's secret self-destruct feature connected to a hydrogen bomb. A few pilots in good conscience could carry out a suicide mission, or so the thinking went. But there's also the importance of Peace Walker as a decision maker. Initially, Strangelove envisioned the project as an expert system, which simply arrives at a conclusion by answering a series of heuristics. The decision to launch a nuke and where to fire it requires much more than the heuristics of, say, deciding what drugs to prescribe someone, or whether to admit a patient into the ER who claims they're having a heart attack. An AI like Peace Walkers must be capable of thinking on a macro as well as a micro scale, using not only expertise but wisdom. And that means building not a weak or specialized AI, but a strong or generalized AI much more similar to a human being. As soon as Snake arrives in the clearing within the lab's ancient walls, We've seemed to step back in time 10 years. Almost everything that Strangelove says to you here is a mimicry of words first spoken during Operation Snake Eater by the boss, partially to torture you as punishment, partially to force you to relive the trauma in order to provoke some semblance of an explanation. Strangelove is essentially staging an artificial miniature reprise of Snake Eater. If you will, a kind of virtual reality, replete even with the boss's horse. At this point, Snake still thinks the boss may really be alive, remember. Hesitantly, he kneels to receive Strangelove's tobacco snuff, almost like a holy sacrament, before following her into the lab's inner sanctum. It is here Snake is finally shown and told the truth. 
The way Strangelove loops the song Sing by the Carpenters as she's working on the mammal pod will be itself eerily echoed in Ground Zeroes by the medieval torturer Skullface. But in this context, it seems Strangelove uses the song to teach the AI pod the joy of language, which after all is a variant of mimicry that we humans inherited from our ancestors, the birds, who are the only other organisms apart from us with the Fox P2 gene, as the Phantom Pain will tell us. Snake is nearly taken in by Strangelove's near religious belief in the boss's everlasting life after death clearly awed by the AI pod's presence. Strangelove lures him to get up close with the pod, and shockingly, it recognizes him. At this horrible moment, Strangelove, who knows, after all, your mission is to destroy the AI, cruelly shuts you inside, giving you just the opportunity to do so. As Snake tries to remove the AI pod's memory boards, a cacophony of overlapping fragments of the boss's voice threaten to overwhelm him. Are these recordings, or are they in Snake's head? It isn't really clear. And before you can finish your mission, Snake collapses from the trauma. It's then you see him experience a strange memory that seems to fold separate events and conversations in on themselves, as some moments from Virtuous Mission we see occurring simultaneously with moments from the end of Operation Snake Eater. This, we figure out, is how Snake has to remember those events, to hide and repress the unbelievable pain. In the false flashback here, Joy really defects, and that's the end of the story as far as Snake can bear to recall. You wake up in the field of white flowers, just like in Selino Yarsk, that strange love has grown conspicuously in front of her inner sanctum. It's then that you see Snake has failed his mission in a callback to the events of Virtuous Mission. A helicopter flies overhead, carrying not the Shagohod, but this time the Mammal Pod, which is now on its way to Peace Walker. And before you can pursue, Snake's attacked by the flying platform Chrysalis. Snake snaps a photo of the Chrysalis, which Chico, thinking it's a UFO, begs for a copy of to sell to the tabloids. After defeating the Chrysalis, Snake heads to the Nicaraguan border atop the boss's horse. Chapter 3, A Nation Reborn, begins with Snake's approach to the secret mine base on the border. It's now two days later, November 21st. And Peace Walker, alongside the AI pods, have all been moved together to a secret base hidden inside an old abandoned gold mine in eastern Heredia. You can see Peace Walker wrapped up in a tarp, clearly having been moved here along yet another river barge. The surrounding area is an old gold mine that again hints towards the theme of subjugation and exploiting the developing world's natural resources during this age of so-called peace. Snake fends off an enemy attack and faces down the weapons platform Cocoon before finally making it inside the base. You infiltrate the hangar and get inside Peace Walker's AI pod, but Snake can't shake the questions that have entered his mind ever since the confrontation with Strangelove. Instead of carrying out his objective, Snake, now face to face with the boss's phantom, can only ask it questions about their final mission together. It seems Strangelove has almost infected Snake with her own curiosity about the truth. But Strangelove knew this would happen. She's used it as a trap. She recognized that the boss's AI registered your presence as soon as you entered the lab, and she used this to lure you right into your enemy's hands. Now that you've been captured, Coldman explains his rationale to you for creating Peace Walker, before he intends to kill you. But Strangelove stops him from doing so, insisting that interrogating you with torture is the only way to really complete the AI. In the next scene, reminiscent of Volgan's torture session from MGS3, Strangelove electrocutes you while demanding answers that you refuse to give. It seems Snake and Miller anticipated a trap and hid a kind of saw-ridged line of string in Snake's fake scar. Kaz, how about something a little sharper next time? You got it. How about a diamond-bladed jigsaw? This is why, notice, that Snake freaks out when Strangelove nearly touches it. The snake-shaped scar on Snake's body, 
that resembles the boss's is revealed to be a fake that he fashioned in her memory. It won't survive this torture, nor nearly does Snake. But just narrowly, you escape. However, by the time you're out, it seems Paz and Galvez have disappeared. There's no time to dwell on this, however, as Snake now has only one last chance to stop Peace Walker once and for all. It turns out Coldman has snatched Paz to take her hostage. Even worse, Strangelove, despite Snake's best efforts to resist, has put the pieces together about what happened in 1964 anyway. With Peace Walker now complete, Coldman informs you its target will be none other than Mother Base. The ensuing radioactive fallout will poison the region and risk a runaway nuclear chain reaction. Snake pursues Coldman and Paz, only to run straight into the fully completed Peace Walker. After firing at it, Peace Walker initializes an attack mode, which pits you against a giant machine for the first time. It's only thanks to MSF that Snake manages to recover his gear and fight Peace Walker without interruption in a strangely nostalgic boss fight that conjures to mind fighting the boss. Elements of Peace Walker's design notice, from its flamethrower to its self-destruct capabilities, which converts the machine into a walking nuclear bomb, would all get recycled to some extent in Huey's following project, Sahelanthropus. Once you manage to hold the thing off, Coldman flies overhead in the same hind helicopter presumably that we saw earlier moving the mammal pod, and bids the giant robot to follow him. Peace Walker then transforms into its mobile mode, and like a spider, starts to crawl away. Only thanks to the boss's old warhorse can Snake give chase in a dramatic scene into the forest as the day is breaking, but despite dodging loose trees and Peace Walker's barrages of missiles, when you get to a steep incline the boss's horse gives out and Peace Walker manages to cross the Rio San Juan into Nicaragua with Coldman's chopper leading the way without you. Amanda has a different faction of Sandinistas, the GPP, track Peace Walker inside Nicaragua to a U.S. military base on the southeastern shore of Lake Cosibolca. Two years ago, there was a terrible earthquake that not only enriched Nicaragua's corrupt ruler, Somoza, but left this part of the country virtually abandoned. Snake has to shoot the boss's horse and, in a grim simulation of ten years ago, put it out of its misery. When Snake kills the boss's horse, he has another flashback, this time more accurate. It seems the Peace Walker ordeal has forced Snake to confront his past and accept the truth. Notice that in some strange way, by denying the boss's real mission to everyone including himself, Snake's been helping her keep her cover story posthumously. Then you take a gondola, provided again by Amanda, and then follow a local guide that she's hired to take you close to the base. After entering the missile base inside a cargo box, Snake makes his way towards the communications tower. Meanwhile, the MSF Sandinistas are moved to safety off base, and Miller starts to organize some backup for what's sure to be a serious confrontation. But shockingly, it seems that the base has been secretly taken over by the Soviets. Dodging their patrols, Snake makes it to a radio room inside the base comms tower. From there, he makes contact with Paz, who tells you that Coldman's just left to enter the final data in preparation for the launch, which will be taking place inside the control tower. But Snake triggers an alarm, meaning to get to the tower, you'll have to face down a ton of Soviet commandos and even a gunship. As the forces of MSF start to converge on the base, Snake battles his way to the top floor control room of the control tower. It is inside here, Coldman, and taken yet again as his hostage, Paz, awaits. It turns out that Peace Walker's big demonstration has been planned to coincide with the SALT II talks, a major diplomatic anti-nuclear summit between the US and the Soviet Union. Coldman will have Strangelove reverse engineer the false launch data so that Peace Walker will be sure to retaliate with its strike against MSF. 
and the ensuing ecological catastrophe from Peace Walker's nuke will poison the region for generations, freeing up a lot of local workers for Coldman to enlist for mass-producing Peace Walkers, and all in the name of economic development. But suddenly, Galvez, kindly Professor Galvez, really of the KGB, shows up, and for a second, all hell seems on the brink of breaking loose. Galvez's real name is Zdornov, and finally, upon his arrival, many questions are answered all at once. Zdornov duped Coldman into thinking that a faction within the KGB was willing to collaborate with the CIA in the Peace Walker project. This is how the tape went from Strangelove to Zdornov, and how and why Mother Base was built in the perfect location for the KGB with American money. It's also how Coldman probably knew that you were coming to Strangelove's lab. But Coldman, as I said, has been tricked. Instead of serving him, Zadornov and the KGB now intend to hijack the Peace Walker project and conduct a false flag nuclear strike to make it look like the Somoza government, armed with an American nuke, decided to destroy communist Cuba. The Soviet Union will refuse to retaliate so that a wave of anti-American sentiment will rock the globe and America will suffer a devastating political and diplomatic loss. On the eve, no less, of the SALT II talks. Zdornov also plans to kill Big Boss here, to falsify the perfect second coming of El Che, as it will seem yet again another heroic revolutionary has been brutally murdered in a CIA-dominated Latin American nation. This is after having already used MSF to shape the Sandinistas into a top-notch fighting force who Zdornov plans to use as the tip of the coming Soviet revolution's spear in Latin America. But what Zdornov doesn't know is Amanda and her Sandinistas have no intention of repeating the sins of Amanda's father and serving as the KGB's lapdogs. Leading the MSF cavalry, Amanda's compas suddenly strike, returning to their homeland while taking on both the KGB and CIA. Damn, point your gun at a comrade! We will not be pawns of the KGB. We will win our own victory! Hasta la victoria siempre! Rescuing Snake, MSF captures Zdornov, but this is only after Zdornov essentially forces Paz to shoot Coldman, who is badly wounded. One reason Zdornov doesn't kill Coldman is he needs him to enter the code for Peace Walker to change targets to Cuba. Although it, the shot didn't kill him, this seems to badly damage Paz's sense of idealism, no less than finding out that Galvez was really a KGB operative all along. Unfortunately, Coldman still lives, and he routes the false attack signal used to trigger Peace Walker's retaliatory strike on Cuba through NORAD, banking on NORAD's inability to order retaliation when faced with signs of a Soviet strike, Coldman dies believing that only Peace Walker will be capable of a retaliatory strike. Even if Cuba wasn't the target he would have picked, his point will have been made. Only a machine can be a truly guaranteed deterrent force, or so he thinks. Only Coldman knows the abort code and it dies with him. The Pentagon, receiving the signal, begin preparations for a retaliatory strike and the only way to cut the fake attack signal, not to mention halt the automated nuclear attack against Cuba, is for Snake to destroy Peace Walker. Will Snake be able to yet again save the world from all-out nuclear war? Will the Pentagon go through with retaliation? And is this the last threat Snake will have to defeat in the name of peace? Find out, should this video receive enough views and support, in the last entry of what even happens in Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker. Until next time, boss.